didn't put too much. It feels like you poured the whole bottle. It's hella expensive, and I don't need you wasting it. Sorry, sure could not be me. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Um, can I see the pack, please? Yeah, all right, that's good. Cause sometimes folks be trying to use the cheap shit and that will damage your hair. Oh no, my mother selects this hair herself. Your mother? Yes, yeah, she owns this shop. And she has a direct source in both China and Malaysia. Okay. And, and can you not make the parts too big? Yeah, sure, no problem. And please don't be braiding it all tight. I am not trying to lose all my damn hair on my edges. I don't braid tight, it's fine. You better not. Oh, I am so tired today. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Broadway World. This is Candace Cordelia and I am so excited for us to talk about one of the best shows that I've seen all year and to talk with a very fantastic actress who is in the show. It is called Jaja's African Hair Braiding and I'm here with Nana Mensa. How are you? I'm great, how are you Candace? I'm doing really good. I it's getting colder outside. This is my favorite time of year, so I'm I'm doing good. How about you? <laughs> Layers. It's so exciting to layer. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. So, first and foremost, you were absolutely wonderful in Jaja's African hair braiding, and there's so much that I personally saw myself reflected in in the show. It took me back to a lot of personal experiences that I had getting my hair braided, even now going to the hair salon, the conversations that we have with strangers and with loved ones, and it's a whole experience. So congratulations for your performance and for being a part of this, what I think is just a, a groundbreaking show that we have on Broadway today. Thank you. Yeah, it feels that way on the inside, I will say. It, it feels like a really special thing that we're up there doing on stage eight shows a week. <laughs> Absolutely. So I understand you're Ghanaian American. My first question for you, Nana, is what was it like? You know, what or what is it like rather being a part of this show and having the background that you have as a Ghanaian American and immersing yourself in the role as Aminata? Yeah, I think um, it is really special i mean my parents came to see the show a couple weeks ago they immigrated from ghana in the 80s and i think like they are really i think they were stunned like they were really like stunned and i think that's the word that kind of keeps coming up a lot when people approach me after the show or you know they'll say like you know uh, somebody on sunday was like a nigerian american man and he was like, I know every single one of those women on stage. I know them. And that was, and he had like tears in his eyes and we had never met before. We were, And so mm -hmm. there's something so powerful that's going on. Um, something that is obviously so much bigger than me. And I'm just, you know, a cog in the, in the, in the wheel of, and um, a cog in the machine of, but I think I just feel really privilege to be able to be a part of this right because immigration is obviously a common theme a common denominator in a lot of my 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 parents story a lot of their generation um you know it affects my cousins me my sibling like I think there's a lot of um it's just kind of always in the ether right and in the same way that it just kind of lightly permeates the play and then obviously mm. saturates it later but I think um I love I love this. I'm so I'm so excited to marry these two things that I'm so passionate about, which is, of course, my experience as an African in America, and then also theater. You know, mm. and you mentioned the word theme, and of course, there's a lot of different themes within Jaja's African hair braiding. One of those themes that really popped out even today when I was looking more into my own research, the theme of rebellion, and you also mentioned immigration. I'm really curious to know from your perspective what your thoughts are on the form of rebellion when it comes to the way that Black women wear their hair, because that seems to be a current conversation, especially in 2023, about the hairstyles that we have in the workplace. Sometimes that can be a contentious you know, situation. I would love to know your thoughts on that and how that also intersects with Jaja's African hair braiding. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, I think there's like a lot of 
far more intelligent women than me who have kind of written on this topic. I'm thinking like Audre Lorde and, um, you know, Toni Morrison and just talking about like what a political act it is to be a Black woman and to live the full expression of your humanity, um, even when it makes people uncomfortable, even when, you know, uh, you know, yeah, people don't want you to. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that there is something very political about, about Black women's hair. And it's been like that since, you know, since the first European landed on an African shore and had an opinion about like what it was that a Black woman could or couldn't do with her hair and in the Caribbean and the, um, uh, what are they called? The laws that they had, it starts with a T, I'm blanking on what it was, but it was like the laws about a Black woman having to have her head wrapped, you know, mm -hmm. having to cover her head, um, you know, in the sweltering heat, the sweltering tropical heat and stuff like that. So it's like, it is very... Um, beautiful to be a part of something that really rips the the tape off of that the red tape off of that conversation it's like oh no you're going to come in here and we're going to celebrate what is on your head and we are going to make you feel as beautiful as you feel on the inside and make your hair match you know I think there's something about that that's like very um subversive and, and you're right like in 2020 in 2023 so I'm just, again, I know this sounds so cheesy, but I'm just so delighted to be a part of it. <laughs> and you absolutely should be because it's a revelation to even witness up close and personal from the set design to the actual act of braiding the hair. And I definitely wanted to ask you about that because I, my best, one of my best friends and I, we went together to watch and we were just blown away by the fact that there's so much going on, but you're also braiding hair. <laughs> you're actually... <laughs> So how how was that for you and the rest of your castmates in terms of being able to master, you know, doing the acting and also performing with the hair braiding and the direction and the cues and all of that happening at once? Yeah, it was crazy because I have been getting my hair braided my entire life, but I'm not a very proficient braider. Then we have someone like Zenzi Williams, who plays B, who, um, you know, was doing her, her cousins like open a salon and she was like training under them like she knows how to do all the styles she can like she's really deft like when it comes to braiding so we were coming into the experience with varying degrees of proficiency mm -hmm. um which and i was at the bottom <laughs> actually no michael Oyede was worse than me okay there was one person the one man of the cast he was worse than me everybody else better than me and so we basically went to like braiding boot camp and nobody assumed anything and we just started from, from the bottom and even some people were learning oh the way that they braided in the salon which is like an over construction is different than they how they've been braiding it which was an underhanded construction so little things like that so we were like you know really learning how they do it in the salon and getting proficient with a couple of like workshops days like on saturdays where suzy oloyade um sorry oludele was coming uh she is hair by Susie. Uh, she's an amazing, amazing braider. Um, very famously did Beyonce's lemonade braids. And, um, and so she uh, came in and taught us like how to hold your hands, how to whatever. And this is again, all hats off to Nakia Mathis, who was our wig designer and, you know, basically the head of our hair department. And she is a genius. I mean, like literally the way that she was able to take her knowledge of stagecraft and take her knowledge of hair and blend those things that it becomes like, it's like Harry Potter, but for black women's hair. <laughs> it's just like the tricks that are going on. I mean, literally and truly, I will take them to my grave, but they are so astounding and so clever and elegant, you know, like sleights of hand and things like that. So again, so grateful. So that's what's really hard. <laughs> It's such an awesome analogy, Harry Potter, because throughout the entire time that I was watching, I'm thinking, how are they doing that? How are they making the changes so swiftly? I don't understand. <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> it's so wild. Did you find yourself for any extensive research going to different hair salons, different African hair braiding salons and just sitting there and just taking in the atmosphere and conversation? I didn't, but I also have logs. I've logged so many hours mm. in there that like, I didn't necessarily have to. I think at the, my main thing was that I'm Ghanaian, I'm also West African, mm -hmm. um, but 
being Senegalese and being Ghanaian are two very different things. It's like being French and being German, you know? So like I needed to kind of immerse myself in like Senegalese life and culture and, you know, things like that. So in that way, I was listening to like a lot of music. I actually made contact on Instagram, God bless Instagram. Um, I just put out a kind of call um, to my followers. If anybody knew anybody who was Senegalese, like of our generation, like living in Senegal, um, and I found a woman and so she helped me with some accent stuff, with some language stuff. So, and this was all this summer, June, July. So that when we started rehearsals in August, I had like, you know, a sense of, uh, of grounding in terms of who she was. And then that, that, that was like a nice baseline that then like working with Whitney White, who is also a magician in another way, an emotional magician an emotional technical master, um, she was able to kind of help me and work with me to uncover and peel back and like really get to the heart of who this woman was as a person. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And I mean, Aminata, I, I'm rooting for everyone in the show. The audience is just rooting for everyone and all the characters are going through their own different trials. Aminata is, is special because I found myself specifically seeing just everything that was happening and you're observing especially when there's all of the things happening with B and, and there's all of it. <laughs> and we're cracking up because we're like, how could B say those things? <laughs> and I'm not standing there like, and you just seem like a very loyal, your character is very loyal and, and believes in friendship and is always seems to be there to help others. Were there any other similarities that you felt going in and reading Aminata that you just said, okay, this is a person that I gel with because of X, Y, Z? Honestly, Aminata and I could not be more different. <laughs> we are absolutely polar opposites. And the funny thing is, is that if you put a camera on me and Zenzi back, like in, in the dressing room or backstage or in life, mm -hmm. I'm B and she's Aminata. Like we are, we are like, our personalities are like, whereas like I'm harder like B and she's softer, like Aminata. So there's been such a wonderful exercise where we get to be these people, be who we are off stage, and then come on stage and basically like, you know, um, body swap or something, you know, just like personality swap. And I get to tap into my softness, which I have armored up over the years. And she gets to soldier her up and kind of put her armor on, which is not the way that she walks through the world. She's a very tender woman. And so, uh, and I'm a little bit more cynical, a little bit more sarcastic. So, um, so that has been really wonderful. And Zenzi and I have never worked together before. So it's just been so like delightful to get to know her and because we really are this Lucy. I mean, uh, Whitney would say we were Lucy and Ethel. Like, mm. We really do have this kind of like banter um, on stage that's very like precise and, and, um, and, and, and specific. So I think exploring my character through our relationship has been really rewarding um but no in terms of me and Aminata I mean and and also you know I think that's one of the things that's been delightful about diving into this role because you know obviously there are some other roles that I've done on in film and television and those characters are very put together and they're very you know very well educated and 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 like you know, prized for their intelligence and like whatnot. And Aminata is not that, you know, she's a little bit chaotic. Mm. She's got kind of a scratch off ticket addiction. She's in a messy relationship. She's, you know, there are all these things about her that are a little bit like, woo, you know, like so the characters that I've played before are all Virgos. Like she's like a uh, Pisces or an Aquarius, if that's your bag. Oh, <laughs> okay. That makes sense actually. That definitely makes sense. You know, and this is your Broadway debut. So it's really just amazing that for your Broadway debut, this is a show that you get to portray such a cool character in. You know, what was that process like for you ahead of getting the role? What did that look like? Ahead of getting the role, I did one reading of the play in 2021 um, and where I had already been working on Nollywood Dreams with Jocelyn at MCC. And um, so this is our second time working together. And I was so um, bowled over by this play, even just reading it on music stands. And I think I've done a lot of developmental readings in my career. And this was the only one where at the end of the reading, I got a stand, we got a standing ovation. I've never 
seen that happen before in a reading with music stands like ever so it was we I think it was in the air we could like feel it that there was something very special about this one um and very quickly MTC committed to doing it um straight to Broadway and I was just like oh my god <laughs> like it was really really stunning and immediately you're like screaming in the street when the offer comes in but then very quickly after that you're like oh my gosh this is heavy like this is like <sighs> you know um this is really important and I can't mess this up and so that's when I do I dove into research and that's when I dove into really getting a sense of who this character was because like especially Jocelyn as a friend and as a collaborator I don't want to let her down you know I want to make sure that like I'm really bringing my A game and so yeah it's been it's been fantastic it's been fantastic um but it was it's also terrifying but as an artist isn't that what we're looking for you know what I mean like I don't necessarily want to go in and do the same job every single day and play the mm -hmm. same for, like this is a real stretch for me and I'm really delighting in the stretch Mm -hmm. What's some advice that Jocelyn Bio, the playwright, gave to you ahead of diving into Jocelyn's African hair braiding? I think there was a lot of, um, there were many things, but the thing that comes to mind the most, like, it's right in front of my mind, was like the rhythm of the shop, the, the humming rhythm of the shop and the dialogue and the way we interact with each other and the mundanity of it. And that through that mundanity, there's actually like a familiarity, there's a quickness, there's a, you know, like these are not people who are kind of like staring off into the middle distance and then coming, but you know, like we are right on it, you know, because we're so comfortable with each other. Um, we work side by side every day. And when you work with your hands, like it's the same kind of like rhythm as if we were all on a factory line or something, like you're working with your hands so your mouth can be doing whatever, you know? And so you're sharing and you're talking and you're teasing and you're whatever. And so she very quickly was like, the way I hear it in my head is like, and she kind of gave like a like a demonstration, like a rhythmic demonstration. And I've really held on to that. Um, it's a show that is incredibly fast paced. It's 90 minutes, no intermission. And you cannot sit back for a moment as an actor inside of it. Like, so the whole time my like antenna are up, you know, and just like, I'm listening really intently and to what, what's going on and how we're interacting um, with each other, because there's not a second to kind of relax into anything. This is not, you know, a very syrupy languid Tennessee Williams situation. You know, it is, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, and so that has been really a delightful challenge. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy in terms of it sounds like it was a dance, like it was a 90 minute workout because you're working everything, your brain, your hands, your body, your full body to just emit this performance. But it's it comes out beautiful in the end. And speaking of the end, it, it leaves such a cliffhanger. Like I, my it took my breath away in terms of the ending. And I kept thinking, what would the next chapter look like for everyone? In your opinion, what would that look like specifically for Aminata? That's a really good question. I don't think I've ever thought about that. I mm -hmm. think it's like what happens to like Masha or like, you know, like the three, like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's like if you look at Chekhov, because I do find this play in its structure and in its intent kind of analogous to, to mm -hmm. some of Chekhov's works. And like they end somewhat abruptly or, or the characters are dealt a blow and then have to kind of pick themselves up and then we leave them. And I feel like that's by design. So like, you know that they're going to be okay, even if they're not, do you know what I mean? They're going to endure, they're gonna persevere. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't, I don't think I've actually ever really crystallized what that looks like. I mean, not to judge her relationship, but I hope <laughs> she leaves her husband. Wait, <laughs> oh my God, of all the things, that's my hope and prayer. <laughs> At least that. You no, know, and I hope she finds a beautiful lover to take care of her yes. and her son and just lavishes <laughs> attention and praise upon her every day of her natural black life. <laughs> Absolutely. That was one of the scenes where everyone was just like, oh my gosh, here we go. But we all, I could tell we all felt for you, but we understood. But because 
we know an Aminata or we are an Aminata. So it was so relatable, but we're just thinking, girl, come on, you got to get out of this situation. <laughs> it's hard. And some, yeah. nights, it's, some nights or some performances, it's harder than others because there are some where I don't know which night you came, uh, mm -hmm. which day you came, but there are some performances where people are screaming at Aminata, like, like literally vocalizing, being like, girl, you better don't like just like yelling <laughs> and just like, oh no, like the groans are so audible that I have to up my volume to make sure they can hear the lines. Like people have a very visceral reaction to that relationship. So if I were to kind of like turn the page and see scene two, my hope is that she would, you know, she would find like genuine, sincere love in her life. Absolutely. 1000%. I was not there for those audible. I mean, we were groaning, but that sounds like it was a completely different <laughs> universe. Were you anticipating you and the cast to have or to hear those type of reactions from the audience and, and thinking this show is really going to bring out those emotions so powerfully night after night? You know, I hadn't considered it. I think I've really got to, you know, kind of doff my hat to MTC and the producers, Taraji P. Henson, LaShawn's, Madison Wells Live for building out an audience that really responds to this type of thing because MTC has a really loyal and very robust subscriber base. But I think the demographic of that subscriber base is not necessarily the type of person that mm. would be vocally responding in the same way or feels invited to vocally sure. respond in that way. And so I love um the there's so many first time ticket buyers to mtc that are coming to see this show because the marketing has been so great and um and i think that that has also given permission to maybe the more seasoned mtc subscriber to participate as well so it kind of has this like amplifying effect where sometimes i just have to pause and let them get it out of their system before i continue talking <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been to a show where the audience was, it was interactive and people were shouting and yelling. And I love that. And I miss that because it doesn't happen every day. So it must feel really good. Especially not on Broadway. Especially yeah. not on Broadway. Yeah. So that Absolutely. feels really special. It does. It feels great. Yeah. I mean, after the show that I saw, there was a Q&A. And I love, our audience was diverse, first and foremost. And there were a lot of very profound reactions and questions in terms of just the culture and the experience from people who are not African, who are not African-American, who have never stepped foot inside of an African hair braiding shop, much less a Black hair salon. Have you received any feedback from others in your world who are not African or African-American? And what did those questions look like in your responses to that? Yeah, I mean, my old boss, who has become a friend, I mean, her daughter is my age, so like, but we're, you know, she's become a friend and she's, um, I adore her. She's lived in Harlem almost the entire time that I've known her. So probably like 15 years, maybe longer. Wow. And, um, and she basically was like, I've lived in Harlem for all this time and I've never stopped to consider what goes on in those hair salons. I've walked mm. by them for years and years. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like really um, maybe a little bit surprising, but second to that, it was really uh, sorry. And and just to be clear, she's a white Jewish woman, so she's mm. you know never had a need to enter these salons. Sure. She doesn't need to get her hair done there. Um, but like, so it was really that was really um, profound to me. And I was like, wow, we have six hundred six hundred fifty seats in this theater at the Freedman, and if half of the people who walk out of here stop to consider the, the, the dynamism of the lives that are lived inside uh, these shops, then we will have done a real, like, we will have really pulled off some magic, you know? Mm. That's, that's a really profound response. And you don't think about it because we're all living our lives on a day-to-day -day basis and doing our thing. And sometimes we're just so wrapped up in our bubble. We don't consider the lived in experiences of other people. So that was a really, that, that is a profound response to this. And on the heels of that, what have you learned or relearned being in this show and playing the role of Aminata as a Ghanaian American person? 
you know, there is one of the things that I think that Jocelyn does so well in the script is really layering the, the um, you know, oftentimes we say, oh, Black people, we are not a monolith. Mm. And I really think she does such a great job of carving out the very specific different kinds of identities of Black women that all come in and leave that shop. Like, obviously, you can't do all of them, but she does really bring a life to a lot of different kinds of black women that we know and who feel familiar to us mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that I love um about that is um one of the things that I was reminded of was the privilege was my privilege as a Ghanaian American right like I was born here and I have a blue passport and some of my cousins and some of my you know aunts and uncles did not have that privilege and that was never a part of my story, trying to figure out how to get my papers. That was something that like, I'm very lucky to have not had to deal with. And so I think that this play has kind of shown a light on that for me personally, and then also for my parents who did have to worry about that and how they were able to navigate a system that was designed to shut them out, frankly, you know, um, and how they persevered and, and the tenacity that they demonstrated I think, uh, made me you know just like a newfound appreciation a newfound respect for what they did you know moving to this country that didn't really want them and saying no we're going to make a way we're going to find a way like I think it's so beautiful and it's like there's a poetry to the way that they've lived their lives even if I don't agree with all of their choices as children and parents often you know kind mm -hmm. of uh you know butt heads but I think <laughs> that like I, I I just respect so much what they have done and what they were able to accomplish um yeah again against the system that didn't necessarily welcome them so yeah. i think it's it's um that has been something that's really on the forefront of my mind also i have not set foot in an african braiding shop in harlem in quite a few years because i would always have this i had my own psychological situation of like you know, sometimes like they would do the style and it's not what I showed them, but it was what they wanted to do or like, you know, or they would do it too tight or they, would mm. do it so they wouldn't like me necessarily take me into consideration. So I would kind of always leave feeling a little bit like a little bit ripped off, a little bit, you know, dissatisfied and whatever. And then a lot of the little shadings that Jocelyn built into the play, little things about like, you know, about the arthritis in your hands and like blisters on your fingers and things like that. It, gave me a whole I don't know I might try going into a Harlem hair braiding salon again <laughs> and with with a newfound empathy for these mm -hmm. women who are on their feet for hours and hours and hours um who are you know breaking their fingers to make you know to make this make this art on our heads you know yeah it's a delicate situation and a delicate relationship that unless you've been in it you don't quite understand I relate to that to going into a shop or having someone come into my parents' home to do my hair and you're just thinking, okay, I know what I want, but I'm just hoping it's not too tight. I'm tender headed. I hope it comes out of <laughs> And you're sitting in the chair for hours. I mean, I can remember the day sitting in the chair for six hours, seven hours to get my hair braided as a kid. And you're just like, it, it's an emotional experience. So I'm glad that mm. this show exists for people to understand and see that. Truly. And also just like, yeah, we are so patient and we are so mm -hmm. tenacious, like to sit there, to do this thing, to make ourselves feel beautiful mm -hmm. and like, you know, to kind of walk out with like our heads held high and to feel really good about ourselves. We are willing to endure for hours mm -hmm. and hours and hours and hours. And I think there's something that like does shift there's like an alchemy, like there's something that shifts in your personality when you are able to do that, when you are able to endure pain or endure like sitting in one spot, not moving for hours on end in order to reach a desired outcome. I think we're special. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I never even thought about it like that, but that makes all the sense. It really does. So if we're able to endure that experience, both sitting in the chair and also standing for hours to braid hair. I mean, there's nothing we can't do, I feel. That part, that yeah. part. <laughs> Honestly, this was such a lovely conversation, Nana. And I know we, we talked about so many things and there should be no reason for anyone to not go see Jaja's African hair braiding. 
But I'm going to leave our conversation asking you, why should people run at the MTC to go see the show? People should run to MTC to come and see Jaja's African Hair Braiding because it is a spectacular play. It is um, geniusly constructed. It is hilarious. And you will come out being a better person than how you enter. Love it. Absolutely love it. I can't argue with that. And thank you, so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Nana. And thank you everyone for watching. This is Broadway World on the Rise with Candace Cordelia. This is Nana Mensa. It's her Broadway debut. So please support her and the rest of her lovely castmates at Jaja's African Hair Braiding. It's at the MTC. See it while you can. I mean, it's from what I understand, it's a packed house every night. So it's not going to last forever. But while it is here, go see it. Thank you all for watching and stay tuned for the next installment.